All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the November Wellness Webinar. My name is Laura Maloof Miller. I'm a Senior Health Education Specialist with HealthNet. As you know, Kristen Kayla is on the line with me as well. And I have just a couple of housekeeping items to review before we begin. Everybody's been muted upon entry so that we can avoid any background noise. And if you wanna change your audio settings, all you need to do is click on the join audio icon. If you experience any technical difficulties, feel free to chat directly to Kristen. All you need to do is open the chat box hover over the Zoom toolbar at the top of the screen and you'll see a chat box icon there. Click on that icon and it should appear. So Kristen will receive your messages in real time and she'll respond to your messages in the order that she receives them. So if there's any delay in her response, she'll get to your message as soon as she can. Now, if you're attending this webinar in a conference room or you used a single webinar access with your team, if you could please chat the number of attendees to Kristen, that way we get a more accurate number on attendance. Today's presentation, Diabetes Prevention Don't Sugarcoat It. Please keep in mind the information provided in this presentation is intended solely for the general information of the audience. It's not medical advice and shall not replace consultation with your physician or other qualified health provider. If you have any health-related questions or problems, please seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider. I actually have a lot to cover today. I'm gonna to start with the difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes with also a mention of gestational diabetes. Now, this will include symptoms, how these conditions are diagnosed, risk factors, and treatment. I will also review the lifestyle changes that can be made to either prevent or delay diabetes onset through nutrition, physical activity, and managing weight. Then we'll take a look at sugar consumption, including what happens in our body when we eat sugar, how to find hidden sugars in foods, food products that appear to be healthy, but are actually loaded with sugar. And finally, some uses for sugar besides putting it in our mouth. Now there are no clear symptoms of prediabetes, so you may have it and not know it. But before people develop diabetes or type two diabetes, they almost always have prediabetes. You can see on the grid, this is where the blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes. Now, if you discover that you do have prediabetes, remember, that doesn't always mean you'll develop type two, particularly if you follow a treatment plan and make changes to your lifestyle through food choices and physical activity. Now, don't worry if you can't get to your ideal body weight, losing even just 10 to 15 pounds can make a huge difference. Work with a healthcare professional to make a plan that's going to work with your lifestyle. Now, doctors sometimes refer to prediabetes as impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose. And that depends on what test was used when it was detected. So this condition can put you at higher risk for developing type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So again, work with your doctor to find a treatment plan. Type two diabetes is the most common form of diabetes. Type two means that your body doesn't use insulin which is a hormone that lets glucose into the cell, it doesn't use it properly. Now, while some people can control their blood sugar levels with healthy eating and exercise, others may need medication or insulin to manage it. There are two types of diabetes, type one and type two. Now, we don't know how to prevent type one diabetes at this time. 
So research is underway to find ways of preventing this condition. As you can see, about 10% of people with diabetes are gonna have type one. This means their pancreas or their body does not produce, either produces a little of insulin or no insulin at all. So those folks must take insulin. Often this occurs with children and young adults. 90% of individuals that have diabetes are going to have type two diabetes. Again, the body becomes at this point resistant to its own insulin. This can be managed by exercise and diet, medications, or sometimes insulin. Mostly it's diagnosed in adults, but we have started to see increases in children and adolescents as well. Gestational diabetes is diabetes diagnosed for the first time during pregnancy. So like other types of diabetes, gestational diabetes affects how your cells use sugar or glucose. Now gestational diabetes causes high blood sugar that can affect the pregnancy and also the baby. While any pregnancy complication of course is concerning, there's actually good news. Expectant mothers can help control gestational diabetes by eating healthy foods, exercise, and if necessary, taking medication. Now controlling blood sugar can keep you and the baby healthy and prevent a difficult delivery. Now when women with gestational diabetes, the blood sugar usually returns to normal soon after the delivery. But if you've had gestational diabetes, you do have a higher risk of getting type two diabetes. So you'll need to be tested for changes in blood sugar more often. In people with type one, symptoms usually have a sudden and dramatic onset. Symptoms include things like sudden weight loss, excessive thirst and hunger, lack of energy, possibly nausea and vomiting, as well as poor growth. Now, symptoms in type two, they're not always as obvious and they tend to occur gradually. However, the common symptoms include, as you can imagine, the glucose or blood sugar is not going into the cell, it's staying in the blood. So of course, that can, that can result in increased thirst, hunger, fatigue, you don't have any energy, the increased urination, especially at nighttime, unexplained weight loss, you may also experience blurred vision, increased infections, sores that you find either do not heal or take a really long time to heal. The scary thing is some people with type two diabetes may not have any symptoms. Now there are several ways to diagnose diabetes. Each way usually needs to be repeated to, to truly diagnose it. So testing should be carried out usually in a healthcare um, settings like a doctor's office or a lab. If your doctor determines that your blood sugar level is very high, or you also have classic symptoms of high blood sugar, in addition to one positive test, then your doctor may not require a second test to diagnose it. Now the A1C test, this measures your average blood sugar level over the past two to three months. The advantages of being diagnosed this way are that you don't have to fast or you don't have to drink anything. Of course, the fasting plasma glucose, as you can imagine, this tests or checks your fasting blood sugar level. So fasting means not having anything to eat or drink except water for at least eight hours before the test. And this test is usually done first thing in the morning, you know, before breakfast. The oral glucose tolerance test, now this is a two hour test. So it's gonna check your blood sugar levels before and then two hours after you drink a special super, super sweet drink. It tells the doctor how your body processes the sugar. And then the random 
plasma glucose test, as you can imagine. This is a test anytime to any time of the day. And usually they do that when you are, uh, when you present with severe diabetes symptoms. You'll also notice there are different levels for like under the fasting plasma glucose for diabetes. That's going to be 126 milligrams per, dec um, per deciliter or higher. That's when you're fasting. And the one for the random, of course, you're not fasting. So that is 200 or higher if you were wondering why those values were different. So there are some of the major risk factors for type two diabetes. Of course, carrying some extra weight, a leading a lifestyle that does not include very much physical activity, our age, our risk goes up as we age, race, African-Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, and Pacific Islanders are disproportionately affected by diabetes. Also, if it you know, runs in your family, uh, if you have currently have prediabetes or if you have or had gestational diabetes. Also, metabolic syndrome is a risk factor. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of three or more of the following. High cholesterol, high triglycerides, low of the good uh, HDL cholesterol, or if you have high levels of the bad cholesterol, LDL, if you have abdominal fat and or high blood pressure. So a combination of three or more of those are gonna be metabolic syndrome. So here are some of the common and more serious long-term complications. Just keep in mind, this is a result from poorly controlled diabetes. So we know that diabetes increases the risk of serious eye diseases, such as cataracts and glaucoma, and it may damage the blood vessels of the retina, potentially leading to blindness. We also know there's a higher risk for gum disease, which can be more severe and take longer to heal. We know that, that diabetes also causes a narrowing of the arteries and increases the risk for heart attack or stroke. Now, high blood sugar triggers inflammation in the blood vessel, abnormality in the blood clotting system, and changes in the fat metabolism that result in increased plaque attaching to the walls of the blood vessels. So this is going to decrease the blood flow and can lead to increased rates of stroke, heart attack, and the changes to the smaller blood vessels in the extremities, such as the eyes and the kidneys. We also know that un or poorly controlled or uncontrolled diabetes affects the nerves throughout our body, causing numbness, pain, and weakness in the hands, arms, feet, and legs. And diabetes may leave you more susceptible to skin problems, such as including uh, bacterial and fungal infections. Left untreated, cuts and blisters can also become serious infections, which may heal poorly. Severe damage might require toe, foot, or leg amputation. So how big is this problem? Unfortunately, these sobering statistics come from the CDC's National Diabetes Statistic Report of 2020. So you can see how many 34.2 million folks have diabetes, that's the total. Those that are diagnosed is 26.9. And look at how many million are undiagnosed. So walking around with diabetes and not knowing that they have it. Under prediabetes, about one in three of us, 18 years and older have prediabetes. And 24.2 million folks 65 and older have prediabetes. So a bit scary there. So people with diabetes and their loved ones, they should learn as much as possible about the latest medical therapies and approaches, as well as healthy lifestyle choices. This, plus good communication with the team of experts, can help you feel in control and better able to respond to changing needs. Now, there's no single diabetes treatment that's best for everyone. 
So, and what works for one person may not work for another. So your doctor can determine how a specific medication or maybe multiple medications may fit into your overall diabetes treatment plan. It can help you understand the advantages and disadvantages of specific diabetes drugs. And there are many different types of drugs that can work in different ways to lower the blood sugar. Sometimes one medication will be enough, but in other cases, your doctor may prescribe a combination of medications. So talk with your doctor to understand what is being prescribed and how it works. Now, insulin is a naturally occurring hormone secreted by your pancreas. Type one diabetes means using insulin. However, if you have type two diabetes, treatment plan can change depending on who you are. Some people can manage it with healthy eating and exercise or with oral medications, while others will need to use insulin. It's actually common for your medication needs to change over time as well. Diabetes is a chronic condition. So insulin cannot be taken as a pill and that's because it would be broken down during digestion. So it must be injected into the fat under your skin for it to get into the blood. And for most people, a glucose meter is just part of life. And there's two main types. There's the standard blood glucose meter that uses a drop of blood to check what your levels are at that moment. There's also a continuous glucose monitor that checks your blood glucose regularly, day or night. So you'll need to work with your physician to pick the one that works best for you and your lifestyle. What can we do to prevent type two diabetes? Well, achieving and maintaining a normal body weight Remember, if you're overweight or obese, aim for at least five to 7% weight loss. A normal body mass index or BMI should be between 18.5 and 24.9. Also, get active. Try to get a minimum of 30 minutes of physical activity. That's a minimum, 30 minutes of physical activity most days of the week. Walking is a great exercise. Now, the complications of diabetes can be prevented or significantly delayed if a person is able to manage their diabetes well in conjunction with their healthcare provider. In fact, many studies show that controlling diabetes can prevent or stop the progression of heart and blood vessel disease. Regular eye exams and timely treatment of diabetes-related eye problems could actually prevent up to 90% of the diabetes-related blindness. So getting regularly scheduled tests and exams is important for preventing these complications, especially the tests that they refer to as the ABCs of diabetes. A is the A1C test. Remember, that's the one that measures the average blood glucose over a three-month period. B is blood pressure, getting your blood pressure checked regularly. And C is cholesterol, getting your cholesterol checked as well. Healthy lifestyle choices can help prevent diabetes, type two diabetes. And that's true even if you have a biological relative living with diabetes. Now, if you've received a diagnosis of prediabetes, lifestyle changes may slow or stop the progression of diabetes. So this includes eating healthy foods, choosing foods lower in fat and calories and higher in fiber, focusing on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, remaining active 30 minutes most days of the week, things like brisk walking, bicycling, running or swimming, losing a modest amount of weight and keeping it off, can delay the progression of prediabetes to, di to type two diabetes. Also, avoiding inactivity for long periods. So just sitting still for long periods, this can increase your risk of type two diabetes. So try to get up every 30 minutes and move around for at least a few minutes. Now we know those carbohydrates, 
they have the greatest impact on the blood sugar level. And everything is a carb, isn't it? Isn't it that what it feels like? Maybe you're already eating a Mediterranean diet or paleo, or you're just trying to eat whole foods. Focus on including the complex carbohydrates in your meal planning. So you wanna skip the simple ones, the chips, the donuts, the cakes, the pies. If you have prediabetes or diabetes, you should be working closely with a dietitian for a meal plan that is specific to your needs, which also may include close monitoring of carbohydrates consumed. Be sure to eat a wide variety of foods. Having a colorful plate is the best way to ensure that you're eating plenty of fruit, vegetables, meats, and other forms of protein, such as nuts, dairy products, and grains and cereals. High fiber. So high fiber foods slow down the absorption of carbohydrates. Therefore, that helps that the blood sugar doesn't rise as quickly. So eating healthy plant foods, plants we know provide vitamins, minerals, and carbohydrates in the diet. Now the carbohydrates include sugars and starches, the energy sources for your body, and fiber. So dietary fiber, also known as roughage or bulk, is the part of the plant that your food, that your body can't digest or absorb. Now fiber-rich foods promote weight loss and they lower your risk of diabetes. So eat a variety of healthy, fiber-rich foods. These include things like tomatoes, peppers, fruits from trees, non-starchy vegetables, such as the green leafy green vegetables, the dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, things like cauliflower, legumes such as beans, chickpeas, lentils, and whole grains, things like whole wheat pasta and bread, whole grain rice, and whole oats. Now, I just said the benefit of fiber was that in addition to slowing down the absorption of the sugars and lowering the blood sugar, they also, fiber also interferes with the absorption of dietary fat and cholesterol, means the fiber kind of sweeps it away out of the body. It also helps with other risk factors that affect heart health, such as blood pressure and inflammation. It also helps, fiber also helps you to eat less because they are more filling and they're energy rich. Now, you wanna avoid the foods that are the bad carbohydrates. These are the things that are gonna be high in sugar with little fiber or nutrients. This is gonna be the white bread and the pastries, the pasta from white flour, fruit juice, and processed foods with sugar or high fructose corn syrup. So when you're managing diabetes, this means avoiding the high spikes in blood sugar. What you wanna aim for or think about are rolling hills. So you eat a little something, a snack, your blood sugar goes up a little, okay? You wanna avoid the really, really tall peaks, the spikes, and then the deep valleys, the sugar highs and the sugar lows, okay? You wanna avoid those. So to do this, don't skip meals. Eat meals and snacks at regular times every day. And if you're on medication, make sure to take it as directed. Now, fatty foods, of course we know, these are high in calories and should be eaten in moderation. To help lose and manage weight, your diet should include a variety of foods with the unsaturated fats. Those are sometimes called the good fats. So get to know mono and poly unsaturated fats. Those promote healthy blood cholesterol levels and good heart and vascular health. So here are some sources of the good fats. You're gonna have your, your oils. You're gonna have nuts and seeds, the fatty fish. So watch out for the saturated fats. Those are considered the bad fats. Those are gonna be found in dairy full, gonna be found in full fat dairy products and in meats. These should be a small part of your diet. Now you can limit saturated fats by eating low fat or non-fat dairy products, varying your protein sources and including those that are plant-based. 
eat from a smaller plate and also eat slowly. Remember your brain takes about, your stomach and your brain have a connection, but it takes about 20 minutes for your stomach to tell your brain we're full using the plate planner as a guide. So one fourth of your plate is gonna be a protein. Um, one fourth of your plate is a grain, hopefully whole grains. And then one half of your plate should be the fruits and vegetables, both whole, they should be whole and natural. What you wanna do is cut back on the high fat foods like whole milk, cheese, any fried foods. See if you can find foods that would have no added sugar and look for items that are low in saturated fat, trans fat and cholesterol. Also see if you can find items with no sugar. This is super hard to do. Look, try to find a spaghetti sauce, even salsas, all those jar products. <sighs> we'll get to it in the, later in the presentation, but a lot of those have sugar in them and a lot of sugar. As you can see on these plates, there's not a lot of sauces. Think about, you know, teriyaki sauce, barbecue, all those kinds have sugar in them. You don't see any cream sauces. Those don't have a lot of fat. So you want to eat whole foods, grilled, baked, broiled, saute your vegetables in olive oil with garlic, roast the vegetables. You can eat raw vegetables with a small amount of salad dressing. Again, just check the label to look for those dressings that either have low or no sugar. Each plate you see here has a serving of protein, in this case, meat and fish. A serving size of meat is like the palm of your hand. A serving size of fish is gonna be like a checkbook. Uh, you see the plate on the right has sauteed vegetables and also a sweet potato. And that is lower on the glycemic index. That, mean it, that means it doesn't raise the blood sugar as much as a standard potato. So include a serving of fruit with low fat or non-fat milk as well. Now you may have already seen a graphic like this before. This is an activity pyramid. So it's gonna outline what we should be doing every day what types of exercise we should be doing most days of the week, also two to three times a week, and the types of sedentary activities that we should be limiting. We know that moderate intensity exercise most days of the week is great for cardiovascular health, but sometimes we actually forget about flexibility and strength training. That should be part of our regular routine as well. The physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend at least 150 minutes a week. That's again, about 30 minutes most days of the week of moderate intensity activity, such as brisk walking. In addition, adults need to do activities that strengthen the muscles at least two days a week. Now, prolonged sitting, the kind like we do when we're working in front of the computer all day, that has now been thought of as just as harmful as smoking. So we need to get up and move setting a timer on your watch or your cell phone or using an app that reminds you to get up is a really good idea. Moving helps to prevent any blood clots which can, formed, which can form with prolonged sitting, such as if you're on a long distance flight. As you can see, all kinds of activity count. And there are so many benefits to regular activity. You can help lose weight, lowers your blood sugar, and actually boosts your sensitivity to insulin which helps you keep your blood sugar within a normal range. Now, losing weight reduces your risk of diabetes. So people in one large study reduced their risk of developing diabetes by almost 60% after losing approximately 7% of their body weight with changes in exercise and diet. As you can see here, the American Diabetes Association recommends that people with prediabetes lose at least seven to 10% of their body weight to prevent the disease progression. And the more weight you lose, that will translate into even greater benefits. So talk with your doctor about what are reasonable expectations and goals for you. Let's talk about sugar. In this image, we can see the consumption of sugar has dramatically increased over the course of, let's say, the last 200 years. This slide shows that in 1822, we consumed an equivalent of one can of soda every five days. And now that has turned into 17 cans of soda every five days. 
Now, Americans on average consume about 130 pounds of sugar each year. This graphic is actually from 2012. So if you can imagine, our sugar consumption is higher today. It's absolutely critical to read the food labels so that you can make a healthier choice and find items that are as low in sugar as possible. Why does sugar call out to us so much? Why do we have such strong cravings for it? Well, back in the days of our ancestors, high energy foods that contain large amounts of carbohydrates and sugars were rare, but important as they ensured the survival and adequate fat storage for times when food was scarce. Eating sugar produces euphoria that is created by the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. So we feel good when we eat sugar. This has helped our ancestors become more sensitive to sugar in their environments. And a taste for sugar also encourages newborn babies to take their mother's breast milk, allowing for survival. When we flood our brains and our bodies with sugar, we slowly build a tolerance to it so that we need more of it in order to satisfy our craving. And today we have a sugar-rich food environment paired with strong marketing of the sugary foods and thus it's inundating our bodies with excessive amounts of processed sugar that of course has a negative effect on our health. So what happens when we eat sugar? Well, that journey begins as soon as that sweet taste hits our tongue. When you consume a food or a beverage containing sugar, the stomach and the digestive system start to process that food so your body can absorb the nutrients. That sugar enters your bloodstream. Hopefully the sugar is then used up as an energy source by our muscles and other, and other cells in the body. The hormone insulin then is released into the blood, into the body when sugar enters the bloodstream. So insulin is gonna act like the key. It's gonna open the cell door, allowing that sugar into the cells so your body can use it for energy. Unfortunately, anything that's excess, guys, is then stored in the liver or as body fat. For example, if you remain sitting after having a donut, the sugar is not needed for energy as you're not being physically active. So that hormone insulin steps in, helps the body store that excess sugar as glycogen or fat. And it's not our fault. You can blame the marketing folks who created ads that draw us in. Now, this is just, so here are some examples of chocolate slogans. See if this sounds familiar. Eat one, eat them all. It was never just about one. One bite is not enough. Taste heavenly pleasure. Say it with chocolate a sweet treat made by nature, blah, 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 okay? For decades, marketing has influenced an emotional connection for us and chocolate. Marketing has made chocolate a necessity during the holidays and celebrations. It's not Valentine's Day without chocolate. What about Easter, Christmas, and of course, Halloween? Dark chocolate has even become promoted by marketing as a healthy candy option. What you see on the right side is a Hershey's advertising, eat healthy. Now I know you can't read the tiny print here, but the idea is that dark chocolate is being promoted as part of a healthy diet. Although dark chocolate contains more antioxidants than milk chocolate, by dubbing the food as healthy, consumers may think that more dark chocolate consumed, the more the health benefit. Okay, this isn't the case, chocolate whether milk, dark, or white, is just another conduit for sugar. So at the end of the day, any kind of chocolate is still candy. 
and should be treated as such. Don't be fooled by the food manufacturers because they're trying to put the wool over your eyes. Okay, guys, I know what you're thinking, but Laura, the darker the chocolate, the lower the sugar content. Yes, that is true. The darker the chocolate, the more bitter the flavor it is. And actually, the more bitter it is, that taste actually helps you eat less of it. You actually don't need as much to feel satisfied. That's, of course, if you can get that down, the bitter taste. Now, the same holds true for all kinds of foods loaded with sugar that are marketed to consumers, young and old. Not to mention those brightly colored boxes that are placed on the shelf right where the kids can reach for it. The food industry likes to say that they're giving us these products because consumers want it. What you're looking at is an illusion of choice. The companies manufacture and advertise these products because they know sugar sells. As a result, very few of the tens of thousands of processed foods available to us are actually free of sugar. Let's take a look at how we could spot those hidden sugars. So instead of consuming a food or a drink just because of what's advertised or the design on the outside of the packaging, checking the nutritional label is the only way to really know how much sugar per serving is in a product. Checking food labels allows you to compare brands, varieties, and flavors of products and choose those that are lower in sugar. Adding up the amount of sugar in the products you eat throughout the day will give you an idea of how much sugar you are eating. The fact is fruit and veggies are composed of complex carbohydrates, okay, which means it takes more time to break them down. Along with being high in fiber, again, this helps to slow the digestion and absorption of sugars into the body. The protein in milk also slows down the absorption of milk, sugar, lactose. However, with processed sugar, there isn't any fiber, protein, or fats to slow the digestive process, making them quickly released into the body's bloodstream after being ingested. And the, results is a, the result is blood sugar highs and then lows, like a sugar crash. Now, fructose is harder on the body to break down. And when there's too much fructose of it in the body, your liver's gonna convert that right into fat. So high fructose corn syrup, that is hard on the body and it's a strain on our liver. Now watch your sugar intake, even if it comes from natural sources, natural and refined sugars are still gonna affect your blood sugar. What about the artificial sweeteners? Now those can have some of their own harmful side effects. And they can be just as heavily manufactured and processed as regular sugar. Pay attention to your body. Are artificial sweeteners making you crave even more sugar or giving you symptoms such as a headache, nausea, or diarrhea? If so, it's time to reevaluate what you are eating and to cut out the artificial sweeteners along with the real sugar. Now, some studies suggest the artificial sweeteners may leave you craving more sugar and that it could make it harder to control your weight. The problem is some experts say that the artificial sweeteners, they don't help you break your taste for sweets. Now, you might be thinking, well, Laura, I limit sweets. Oh, I'm fine. Not so fast. If you think you don't have a, sugar, a sweet sugar tooth, but you crave bagels, chips, french fries, these starchy foods are complex carbs that the body breaks down into simple sugars. So these foods eaten without better foods, the starches can make your blood sugar surge and then crash like sugar. Things like white rice, white flour, they do this highly refined starches like white bread, pretzels, crackers, and pasta are among the worst. So these are highly refined starches that are heavily processed. And just like table sugar, they're stripped of any fiber and nutrients, okay? 
So in general, you wanna to try to stick to a whole grain bread, pasta and flour. Other great options include buckwheat, things like brown and wild rices. And in case you're wondering why there's a banana on this picture, well, green bananas contain up to 80% starch. That's measured in dry weight. During the ripening process though, the starch is converted into sugar and it ends up being less than 1% when the banana is fully ripe. Now, you don't always see the word sugar on a food label. It sometimes goes by other names like these. So you wanna watch out for items that list any form of sugar in the first few ingredients. <coughs> food items are listed by weight in the list of ingredients. For example, sh if sugar is listed, the, one of the first ingredients in the list, then by weight, this food item is mostly sugar. Now, some foods contain ingredients with tricky names so that you can't identify them as the very thing you're trying to limit from your diet, sugar. The items listed here are health food imposters. Now, not all foods and beverages that are considered healthy options are equal. Some brands carry more sugar than others, and some are simply marketed as being healthy. Other versions of these foods could be wholesome options, but again, the only way to, to, to know is to look at the nutritional label. Look for additive sugar additives as well as the total amount of sugar. You know, those gummy fruit snacks, although these products may contain some juice, they are usually nothing more than candy infused with vitamins. They also contain high fructose corn syrup. The sports drinks, carb rich electric light drinks. Now those can be lifesavers during high intensity activity like running, which lasts an hour or longer, but too often they're consumed during short exercises or no exercise at all. So their main ingredient is sugar. Now the flavored waters, smoothies, those have vitamins, yes, but up to 200 calories per bottle. Just one of these a day can cause a 20 pound weight gain, gain in a year if those calories are not burned off. The fruit can be the fruit smoothie drinks like uh, Naked Juice or Dwala. They can be extremely high in sugar, with some fruit juice beverages as high as 45 grams of sugar in 12 ounces. That's more than a can of Coke. Now, those cereal bars, although they are brands that boast of containing fiber and whole grains, all too many of the varieties are packed with sugar. So make sure to check the nutrition label. When you want to go for those nut butters, the ingredients should be nuts, salt, that's about it. Flavorings like cinnamon, that's okay. But watch out for the chocolate and salty caramel blends. Some of these packs have more than 20 grams of sugar per serving. Campbell's soup, the tomato soup, 12 grams of sugar in each half cup. So you eat the whole can, that could, could set you back 30 grams. That's the equivalent of three Krispy Kreme donuts. However, Tomatoes are a good source of fiber, potassium, vitamin C, K, and they're full of an antioxidants. So to maximize the benefits of consuming a tomato product, choose an option that has little to no sugar. And while you're at it, look for ones that are low in salt as well. Watch out for those fat-free salad dressings. <clears throat> now a salad without a little bit of fat is not living up to its potential. You do need a little fat in order to absorb the vitamins A, D, E, and K. But these dressings, although they may not contain fat, but they could contain nearly as much sugar as two chocolate chip cookies. Now, low-fat yogurt is notorious for being high in sugar. Yoplait's original strawberry contains 26 grams of sugar in a six-ounce container. Dannon's Activia, 19 grams of sugar, the same as a Twinkie. Now, the good news is that not all yogurt products are packed with sugar. You have to choose wisely. And when you do, it's a nutritional powerhouse packed with good digested bacteria, calcium, and protein. So use these types of things to enhance uh, the flavor without sugar, different spices, fruit toppings, replace sugar in recipes with stevia. Okay, this is about 100 to 300 times sweeter than table sugar but it has no carbohydrates 
calories or artificial ingredients. However, use sparingly and in moderation. When baking, you can put pureed fruit like apples, figs, dates, bananas. Those are better to use. It helps you to cut down on the refined sugar. So what do we do to get rid of that sweet tooth? Clear your pantry, get rid of all the temptations and don't bring that stuff home. Cutting down on the sugary beverages and having a backup plan because you, if you start to, to lower your sugar intake, the cravings may feel uncontrollable. So think about calling a friend, eating a piece of fruit, listening to favorite music or getting outside and walking. Here come the holidays, okay? So you really can't out-exercise your fork. Don't say to yourself, I'm gonna have a piece of cheesecake and next time I walk, I'll walk it, I'll walk it off next time I'm walking the dog. Exercise can actually lessen the sugar cravings and change the way you eat in general. Exercise helps to boost your mood and it may help from turning those sweets off because of emotional eating. It can help you to be more active. You can see on here, if you eat a medium-sized chocolate chip cookie, it's gonna take 30 minutes. But if you were to eat a medium-sized banana, only about 13 minutes to burn those calories off. What can we do with sugar? If we have a lot of it lying around the house, sugar makes a splendid exfoliating agent. It's a body scrub. So you can make a super simple one by mixing sugar with some type of oil. Maybe it's almond oil, canola oil, olive oil. Create a loose paste, add some essential oils or vanilla, rub that on your skin and then rinse it off in the shower. Just resist the temptation to lick it off. For extra dirty hands, you can mix with uh, your regular soap, add a little sugar in there and it acts as an abrasive. Also cleaning the clothes, you have some grass stains, you can mix some warm water with sugar, let it sit on the grass stains. You can mix three teaspoons of sugar and two tablespoons of white vinegar in a quart of warm water and add that to your fresh flowers. Now, some people swear that they put uh, storing sugar with your cheese will help it prevent from molding. And if you wanna clean your coffee grinder or your spice grinder, you pour about a fourth of a cup of sugar into the grinder, run it for a couple of minutes, and then remove the sugar and clean it well. This helps to get rid of any oil or deposits inside. These last couple of slides are programs that we offer for our HealthNet members. So when you log on to your HealthNet account, you can find our wellness programs and other resources. My Strength is the health club for your mind. It's a great tool for our HealthNet members. It's an online program as well as an app and it has modules on reducing stress, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, as well as joy, laughter, positivity, meditation, mindfulness, and much more. If you'd like some telephonic support, if you're tackling some new health goals, think about working with a health coach. And if you have a health concern, our health net members can call the nurse advice line to speak with a registered nurse. Take advantage of our member discounts. We have discounts on Weight Watchers, chiropractic, acupuncture services, eye care, and more. If you're a HealthNet member and interested in joining Weight Watchers, HealthNet enrolled participants get a 50% discount for the first six months. And last but not least, please mark your calendar and join us for next month's webinar, Money Talks, Plan for Tomorrow, Today. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you haven't already chatted the number of attendees in your group, please do so now. And I hope you will join me next month. Have a good afternoon, everybody. You may exit the webinar at this time.